Our next presentation, we have Gordon Woodcock uh, presenting on DC to AC ratio optimization. Thanks, Janine. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. It looks like some artistic license, at least on my screen with uh, this initial background. I'm getting some pastel colors, but it's, uh, it's kind of cool. So, uh, anyway, my name is Gordon Woodcock. I'm product manager with Keiko New Energy, a multinational inverter manufacturer, and we'll be talking about, as Janine said, DC to AC ratio optimization uh, with respect to photovoltaic arrays. Uh, advanced, please. We'll do a quick introduction of, of DC to AC ratio and what it's being optimized or what is being optimized, uh, some of the data sources, what was the initial analysis set up, some of the initial results, uh, potential applications, and next steps where I'd like to take the analysis. Next, please. So DC to AC ratio or the power ratio is basically the the maximum rated array power in DC kilowatts compared to the maximum rated inverter capacity. So it's the size of the DC array, rated DC array maximum compared to the, the rated inverter output. Uh, we'll be looking at how net present value is affected by changing that DC to AC ratio. And net present value is, the, of course, the time series of cash flows, revenues and expenses brought into the present via some discount rate. I in the equation shown here. Uh, next, please. This is a, a quick look at DC to AC ratio and the impact that it has on, on energy production. In this case, it's a, a ratio of 1.33, 133 kilowatts DC to a 100 kilowatt AC inverter. Uh, this is a time series data pulled from, from SAM on a, a given day in June, I think, in New Mexico. And you can see that, you know, on this given day, the, the and array wants to put out about 125 kilowatts. And as you you get towards 10 a.m. from 10 to 4 p.m., the inverter is stepping off of its maximum power point and throttling back. It's not putting out or able to process all of the available DC power. So some people look at this and say you're throwing away energy, which, you know, is true. You're not utilizing all of the, the array's potential. Uh, advanced one, please. And so this shows a more modestly sized array of 116 kilowatts to 100 kilowatt array or 100 kilowatt inverter, about a 1.16 ratio. You can see the DC is peaking at around 105 kilowatts. The only losses wiring and inverter efficiency. The inverter is really not clipping it at all, so you're you're utilizing all of the array's potential. It's, it's getting turned into AC power. But if you look at the difference between the AC curve at 1.33, the red curve, and the AC curve at 1.16, the purple curve, you see that difference between the, the two curves, that area, is lost energy production. And that's the rationale that, that some people have for increasing the array size for increasing the DC to AC ratio is to maximize your energy harvest. Advance, please. So the maximum net present value as a function of DC to AC ratio, and that's the nice thing about the net present value is there's one peak. There is one optimum condition, but that, that optimum is going to change or that optimum is going to change based on a site-specific condition. So as location changes, as incentives changes, all these variables change, the max net present value, where it occurs with respect to DC to AC ratio is also going to change. Advance. This is a, a thought map basically trying to capture some of those interactions on a top level, how these variables affect net present value. So, of course, you have the discount rate, I, that, that was shown in the equation earlier. You see the revenues and expenses. For a, a photovoltaic system, sun hours, energy prices, dollars per kilowatt hour, the incentives, dollars per kilowatt hour or, or dollars per kilowatt net capacity-based incentive, all impact revenues. As sun hours increase, the, the energy yield increases and the revenue associated with that. On the expense side, uh, of course, financing, how, it, how the time series of cash flows change with financing, taxes, material costs, install costs, all those driving expenses, and behind that is DC to AC ratio. 
As we saw earlier, if you increase the DCAC ratio, you can increase your energy harvest, which will increase revenues, and it will also increase your installation costs, land and labor, the material costs, inverters, modules. Those all change as DCAC ratio changes. Advance, please. So to look at the initial analysis and try and simplify the interaction of all these variables, I blocked it into two cases. The, the first bracket is this no financing case, which is split into different locations, and within those locations you have different racking types, a, a fixed and a single axis tracker, and then within that I utilize SAM's parametric analysis tool to model a changing DC to AC ratio based on the number of modules per string and the number of strings. The baseline cases the price per watt varied from about 250 to $3 a watt uh, based on labor costs and land costs and, and racking type. I used a discount rate of 6.8%, the analysis period 25 years, and utility rates and incentives, be they performance-based or capacity-based, were, were varied by location uh, according to what the utilities and, and uh, governments are allowing there. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the financing block, the other side of the bracket. Basically, everything's the same as far as the setup location and racking. The difference being the financing option assumed at 20% down, 80% finance over 20 years at, at 6%. And, you know, some of these conditions could, could definitely be argued. I, I tried to approximate what I felt was a, a real-world conditions, maybe a little optimistic on the installation costs, but I think that's the, the direction we're headed. And in any case, it's, it's mainly just baseline conditions to look at how net present value changes as a function of DC to AC ratio under these constraints. Advance, please. So data sources, land and land preparation costs, labor rates, some of that came from RS means online. Instead of using the rate structures that you can download into SAM, I used retail electricity rates from the Energy and Information Administration, it seemed a little simpler and, and more transparent rather than getting to some of the complexity of the different rate structures. I did download the incentives via SAM and then cross-reference them with Desire and, of course, used the system advisor model, which I've been using for about three or four years now, and it's, you know, continually improving and, and getting more sophisticated. So I want to take an opportunity to say thanks to all the people at NREL for working on that tool. Uh, events. Here's some of the initial results. This is the ground-mounted array, no financing scenario. You can see the locations from top to bottom, Los Angeles, Boulder, Albuquerque, Salt Lake, and Huntsville, and the conditions, the relative cases in each location, sun hours, install cost per watt, the net metered utility rate, and the incentive. And so you, the, the initial thing that obviously jumps out when you look at this is the the magnitude, the difference in magnitude between, say, somewhere like Huntsville and somewhere like Los Angeles, where the net present value is considerably larger across the range of DC to AC ratios. If you look a little bit closer, you can see that you know, LA and Boulder are very similar in sun hours, install costs, and even aggregate energy price, the sum of the, the utility rate and the, the incentive, but the return the net, or the net present value is significantly higher in Los Angeles because I use a net metered rate applied over 25 years and the performance-based incentive really only occurs over 10 years. So the, the effect of, of, of net metering over 25 years clearly outweighs the, the PBI over uh, 10 years. The other thing to notice is where that ideal DC to AC ratio with respect to net present value occurs at Los Angeles and Boulder, I don't know if anyone can see the x-axis, it's not up on my screen, but that ideal is occurring at about 1.7. For Albuquerque, it's closer to 1.3, 1.35. It's primarily driven by the utility rates and the incentives, uh, I believe. Uh, another thing I want to note is that, you know, the, the true ideal might occur at, at somewhere else on these, these curves. The markers that are shown just indicate real-world design cases where integer number of strings and integer number of, number of modules combine to produce a DC to AC ratio. Next slide, please. Now, here's a single-axis tracker. The, the 
general magnitude is, is the same in, in that Los Angeles to Boulder to Albuquerque, the, the rankings are essentially the same, although Huntsville's popped up above Salt Lake City thanks to the performance-based incentive and the increased production of a single-axis tracker under these conditions. However, one thing to point out here is that in every case, that ideal VC to AC ratio occurs at a lower point. So the, the point of diminishing returns where additional capacity and the increased yield and revenues, where, where those are offset by increased expenses, it's happening at an earlier point with single axis trackers. Los Angeles on a ground mount is about 1.7. With the single axis tracker, we're seeing that ideal DC to AC ratio at about, I think, 1.5 or so. Next slide, please. So here's the financing bracket, and I was not not shocked, I guess, but a little surprised at the impact that financing had. Of course, compared to a ground-mounted array under without financing, the returns are going to be better. The net present value across the board is going to be better. That's why we all love financing so much. But what, what jumped out at me is where the ideal PC to AC ratio falls under a financing scenario with these constraints, and that's... It's a you know it's about two. Again, I don't know if anybody can see the x-axis, uh, but it's it's shifted out considerably under the financing scenarios because of how those time series of cash flows how those are altered by a financing model. Uh, next slide, please. A similar story with single axis tracker financing has shifted out where that peak occurs, although the single axis tracker. That, that driving effect of moving the the ideal DC to AC ratio, it's occurring at a lower point relative to a ground-mounted or a fixed array under the financing scenario. Um, could, you, could you advance one, please? So this is just an overlay of the Los Angeles single axis tracker without financing, and I scaled it for the y-axis. It, it isn't happening or the net present value numbers don't line up perfectly. Uh, it's just an overlay to show how that that shift in where the ideal DC to AC ratio occurs changes uh, relative to financing relative to no financing. So in every case, if you could advance uh, the next four. In every case, that, that peak or where net present value is maximized as a function of DC to AC ratio, in every case, no financing, it occurs at a, at a lower value. Advance, please. And this is just a quick look at, at how sun hours can impact net present value and, and if it has an impact on the peak at all. So I basically took the took Los Angeles and moved it to Pittsburgh, which is fun to do with a, a modeling or a simulation, I guess. But Los Angeles tracking the green curve compared to Pittsburgh tracking the purple curve, it's you know, basically the same shape. The peak occurs at roughly the same DC to AC ratio. It's just a, a difference in magnitude. A similar story with the, the fixed array in Los Angeles to uh, a fixed array in Pittsburgh. The general shape where that peak occurs hasn't changed. It's simply a question of the, the net present value. Next slide. So for me, this data is very useful as an inverter manufacturer because I can, I can look and, and understand why DC to AC ratios, why customers are asking for higher ratios. And I, I can take this data and, and show it to management and build a business case around new products, either you know, verifying products to operate at considerably higher DC to AC ratios or designing new products that, that meet market needs. For developers and designers that aren't already looking at net present value, and, and how to maximize it as a function of, of DC to AC ratio. You know, I think it, there's a clear case for why they should, those that aren't, uh, you know, respecting the other design constraints like utility requirements, uh, product specifications, and, and, and site specifications. But you can clearly use SAN to optimize your, your in return on investment um, or your net present value by tweaking the array size relative to the inverter size. And while the policymakers may not care about DC to AC ratios strictly, they can certainly look at how 
net present value is affected by taxes and incentives and, and energy prices and, and hopefully at least consider the impacts of, of future decisions and, and how they can maximize uh, the economic returns of, of solar photovoltaic systems. Next, please. So for me, I'd like to take more rigorous analysis add some more variables into the parametric analysis and really look at how they're interacting, which ones are most significant, and use that to to create some future scenarios where we can, you know, look at look at under those scenarios what products will fit consumer needs based on, you know, how module prices are going to change within some reasonable range, say fifty cents per watt to a dollar per watt. Or you know what what is going to happen with discount rates? So where is that peak net present value going to occur as a function of DC to AC ratio, and how can we design products to to meet those customer needs? With that, I will leave it open to any questions. If you would like to ask a question, it is star one and record your name. I have a question here. Um, there are Nova Fenner. Do you have any experience or data um, in terms of impact on uh, long-term reliability and maintenance of inverters that are dri that are driven maxed out um, during the middle of the day, which is more common with a high DCA ratio? I think that's one of those ask an economist. You know, ask a different economist and get a different answer kind of questions. You know, in my experience, that when I go to the engineering team, it really depends on who you ask, what effect running, you know, redlining those inverters really has on reliability. I think there's definitely some constraints where you're you're strictly limited to some maximum DC input. But yeah, the the lifetime impacts, yeah, it's not different. People have different opinions, and I don't have a definite answer for that.